Thank you so much for the warm welcome and for the opening prayer. And um, I can't see everybody in there that's watching, but I can see some of your faces. Lovely to see you. Greetings from Newcastle, Australia. It's 10 p.m. and the night here, but I'm excited to be here with you. And my husband's in the room too. He's just over there. But uh, tonight's message, I wanted to start with something that is very exciting. And so let us begin. Uh, I know we just had a prayer, but I'll just say one more also. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we open your word, please may your Holy Spirit speak through me and speak to all of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I don't know if it's the same in the Philippines as it is in Australia, but everybody gets really excited when you start talking to them about getting married. Is that true in the Philippines too? Yeah, people get excited. Yes. When you start talking about getting married, they just get all excited. And I, to my surprise, the Bible's no different. And so I hope you all have a Bible. I have my Bible here. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to take them. And turn with me to Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 and 7. And we're going to discover that heaven gets excited about a wedding too. <laughs> so Revelation chapter 19, and we'll begin reading together in verses 6 and 7. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings, a little bit like what we heard in our theme song just now. That was great. Saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And I know I can't let you say amen because we're all muted, but I'll say amen to that because would you like to hear an amazing fact? Did you know that the word hallelujah, it appears only four times in the New Testament and it's only found in Revelation chapter 19. So what we are in right now, Revelation chapter 19, this is the original hallelujah chorus of the Bible. In Psalms, in Hebrew, the equivalent is translated as praise the Lord. So whenever you read in Psalms, th those phrase, praise the Lord, it's really the word hallelujah. And so this one word is really driving everything that we read here in chapter 19. It is almost to me as we read this passage of scripture, that the whole New Testament, all 26 books and 18 chapters has been driving us to this point. It's been telling us the story of Jesus and how he came from heaven to earth and how he lived among us and died on a cross and how he rose from the grave and he ascended into heaven. He sent us the Holy Spirit. He ministers in heaven's holy sanctuary for us. And now all that's left for him to do in this chapter is for heaven to shout aloud reverberating hallelujah of praise to God because the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I see some of you nodding. That's exciting. <laughs> All right. So, friends, as we come here, we just need to realize again that when we read the Bible, we are reading the greatest love story ever told of the greatest lover that there ever was. You know the story, and I'll just recap it a little bit for us. Because many years ago in a garden called Eden, a paradise of pleasure that God made, God made man in his image, and the relationship that he shared with Adam and Eve was very special. In fact, God, Scripture describes God's relationship to us as being like that of a marriage, actually. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, God says, I am married to you. There's no, there was no fear, no shame in their relationship. It was just perfect love. But then one day things went wrong. Lies were told in that garden. Belief, uh, those lives were believed. Trust was broken and the heart of God was shattered. Anyone who has ever experienced any kind of unfaithfulness in a relationship, you have experienced just a little of the pain that pierced the heart of God when that trust was broken in the Garden of Eden. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, the Bible tells us that God drove the man 
drove out the man from the Garden of Eden. And actually in the Hebrew, that word to drive out means to divorce. Sin meant that Adam and Eve had to be divorced from God's presence. But God's heart ached for reconciliation with his earth children. And so he told Adam and Eve that he had a plan and he would make a way for their relationship to be restored. Praise God that love always finds a way. And so for the rest 6,000 years, God has been, if you will, like a bereft husband. He's been seeking to try and win us to himself again. Ask Hosea about it. He'll tell you what it's like. You boil the whole salvation story down. And really, the Bible is about the tireless pursuit of God, the injured bridegroom for his prodigal bride, his church, his people. And uh, I find this really amazing. Now, just a little pause in our discussion. Did you know that when it comes time for a female eagle to choose her mate, there are many suitors that come along, but she just doesn't go for anybody. She knows what she wants, and that's a good uh, leaf we can all take out of the eagle's book. We should know what we want. Otherwise, we'll find what we want every single time. And so this is what she does. She will pick up a stick. I should have brought one in here for show and tell. She will pick up a stick and she will fly high with that stick. And the suitor, if he's a good one, he'll be watching her and he'll follow her up into the air. And when she gets to a certain height, she will drop the stick. And if he's a good suitor, he will swoop down and he will catch that stick in his beak and she will be impressed. But she's not just going to let that happen too easily. She will go and she will get a bigger stick and she will fly a little bit higher and she will drop that bigger stick and she will watch him. And if he catches it well, he still passes the test. She will pick up the biggest stick that she can find. She'll fly as high as she could go, and when she drops that stick, and if he can catch that biggest stick that she can carry, well, then she knows that she's found the one. (laughs) And the reason why she does this strange routine is because one day she knows that if she settles down with this suitor and they get together, then little eaglets may come along and they're going to build their nest high up somewhere. And it is possible that those little eaglets might fall out of the nest as they're trying to learn to fly. And she needs somebody, a male who can come down and catch the young ones before they hit the ground. So isn't that amazing how sometimes the attributes of God, they're so clearly seen in nature. And I just I think that's an excellent illustration because when I look at the Bible, to me, it's almost like God has, he's been trying to win the affections of his people, trying to get our attention, trying to help us to recognize that he loves us. And so he comes to a man named Abraham and he makes this amazing covenant promise to him. And he tells him that he would make of Abraham a great nation and that through them, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And of course, by an absolute miracle, God kept his promise, right? Um, It was like (laughs) the log was dropped and God caught it. He kept his promise. And through Isaac, a nation was born through whom God faithfully kept his promise to them, even though they were so unfaithful to him. And then we come to the New Testament. And suddenly this relationship pursuit takes a twist and a turn that nobody in the universe saw coming. This happened to me. I was at my local church one Sabbath morning and uh, this young man showed up. I'd never seen him before. And he, I went to greet him and welcome him. This was before COVID, of course, to shake his hand. And he just said to me without saying hello or anything, no happy Sabbath. He just said to me, I'm here to find a wife. I I couldn't help him at that time. I didn't know who to point him to. There was nothing I could do. But when Jesus came to this world, he came to take a wife. That's why I told you that. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says this. Ephesians 5, verse 25. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. 
So this is a really powerful concept that we're about to just step through a little bit right now because um, understanding this can really change how you relate to scripture. And by the way, husbands, what a wonderful example you have and a standard you have in Jesus. Well, let's just step through for a moment some aspects of a wedding or how people got married in Jewish culture. Because you see, when a man loved a woman, proposed to her, and she said yes, well, the wedding would take place in a couple of stages. So listen, here we go. Point number one, the bridegroom would go to the bride's home and he would negotiate a bride price with the father of the bride and he would pay it. Although the bride price was paid to the father of the bride, it was actually eventually going to become part of the bride's dowry, the property that she would take with her when she got married. So listen to this. 2,000 years ago, Jesus left his father's house to come down to this earth to die for his bride. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were not sinners, <laughs> I can see you all correcting me. That's wonderful. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So at Calvary, as the Lamb of God, Jesus was taking away the sin of the world. And there Jesus paid the bride price, as it were, with his own blood for you and for me. As part of this process, there was also a ceremony called the betrothal ceremony. And this would take place. And there were three things that would happen in this. Number one, a covenant, also called a ketubah, was drawn up. That was the name of the covenant, a ketubah covenant. And it was filled with promises of the couple to each other. And it was signed by the couple as well. And the original of this covenant was actually kept in a synagogue in their local town. This was a legal document that meant the couple was married in every way except for in the consummation of the marriage. Point number two, after signing this covenant, the bride and groom would drink from a shared cup and they wouldn't do this again until they were married that should ring a bell or two for somebody here. Point number three, the bridegroom and the bride would go separately through a ceremonial washing, signifying that they were entering into this time of betrothal in purity, having agreed to keep one another exclusively for them, like they were keeping themselves for the other person. Isn't that amazing? Because when we commit our lives to Jesus in baptism, we are saying a public yes to Jesus and a public no to everybody else. We are saying we are keeping ourselves for him. We're going to live for Jesus. Then the bridegroom would actually return to his father's home to prepare a place for his bride. And listen to this. This is amazing because it wasn't uncommon for a groom to build onto his father's home. And when he went, he might say something like this. I'm going to prepare a place for you but I will come again and receive you unto myself so that we can be together in my father's house. Do those words ring a bell to anybody here? Isn't that amazing? Because when Jesus spoke those wonderful words that we love in John 14, one to three, Jesus was using wedding language and the disciples knew all about it. Oh, this is also amazing because it was also the responsibility of the local rabbi to inspect the dwelling place that the groom prepared for the bride to get this, to make sure that it was an acceptable place for her to go to when she left her home, her father's home to go to the groom's home. And he would actually make sure it was better than what she was leaving behind. Oh, I love this because the last two books of the Bible, sorry, the last two chapters of the last book of the Bible tell us that God is preparing a home for you and for me that is so much better than this home that we're going to leave behind. There's no coronavirus in heaven. There's no cancer in heaven. There's no divorce in heaven. There's we, we don't have to even Zoom in heaven. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be able to all be together. No isolation. <laughs> and so this is exciting. No more death. No war. No pain. The bride would stay in her father's home. 
And not, while she was there, she wasn't just sitting around watching the clock. And she was there preparing herself for the time when her groom would come. And the maximum amount of time she might wait was one year. Friends, that means right now. As we are waiting for Jesus to come, we're not just sitting here doing nothing. We are, we are here preparing for Jesus to come. We should prepare to meet our bridegroom. And of course, when both bride and place were ready, the bridegroom would come. Take his bride with him to his father's house. There'd be a wonderful procession. The wedding would happen. The marriage supper would be there. And the bride and groom would join their guests for a wonderful feast of celebration. Does that sound good? Yeah. <laughs> we all love a wedding. What a God. What a groom. What a lover is our God. But wait, there is more. Because John the Revelator, he actually got to have a sneak peak of the coming of the bridegroom. We're going to look at that together now. So you've got your Bibles, take them, come with me to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, because as we step through this, there are some names, some titles, which help us to know a little bit more about our heavenly bridegroom that you just, you have to see it because it's amazing. So here we go. Here we go. Revelation chapter 19, and we're looking at verse 11. Let's read it together. It says, Now I saw heaven open. Now who's the I that is speaking here? This is John. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Hit the pause button. Let's come back, because Hollywood cannot compete with this. This verse that you and I just read right here, this makes the brightest day in human history look like midnight. You see, in Revelation chapter 13, those who worship the beast and the dragon, they questioned and they said this, who is like the beast? In verse 4, Revelation 13 verse 4, they said, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Well, Revelation chapter 19 verse 11 tells us the answer to that question. This is the answer, and I believe it is the answer to all of our questions and struggles and conflicts that we encounter in this life. For the first time, John says he doesn't just see a door opened in heaven, but he sees all of heaven opened, and he sees Jesus, our heavenly bridegroom, burst into view. And he's riding, he's a, he's a, he's a mighty warrior, riding on a magnificent white horse at the very midnight of human history. Do you know the song, Here Comes the Bride? Okay. Forget Here Comes the Bride. Here Comes the Groom. <laughs> The last time the world saw Jesus, they saw him riding on a donkey. But this time when John sees Jesus, he sees him riding on a white horse as a conquering warrior. The last time the world saw Jesus, he came as a redeemer and he wore a crown of thorns and he, he died on the cross. But the next time the world sees Jesus, he's coming as a triumphant king. He's coming to reign and he's coming to rule. And as Jesus introduces himself to Laodicea, by the way, in chapter 3 of Revelation, he tells Laodicea, he introduces himself as the faithful and true witness, our champion of eternal justice, our groom, wants you to know tonight that he's faithful and true. Study God's word and you will find every promise. Every verse tells you that God is faithful to you. Even to the point of death, God has been faithful to you. Never unfaithful. Always 100% faithful and true to you. And this is, this is a wonderful quality when you think about it. You want a groom who has those qualities. In fact, Joshua, in the book of Joshua, chapter 21, verse 45, the Bible says, Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. This means that you and I can trust Jesus in sickness and in health. 
We can trust him for richer or for poorer. We can trust Jesus till death do us part. We can trust him all the way. Lamentations, we know this first. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says, Great is your faithfulness. In Psalm 36, verse 5, the psalmist says, Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness, it reaches to the clouds. I love that verse because I'm not particularly a fan of flying in planes. And so I remember this when I'm at 37,000 feet up in the sky. I like to remember that God's faithfulness meets me there and it is higher still. Have you experienced the faithfulness of God to you in your life? Just think about it. I, uh, I want to share just a very brief story. I was invited to do um, to speak in American Samoa for uh, similar meetings. They were like a youth uh, congress kind of meeting. And um, I was invited to get there. But the way you get from uh, to American Samoa is you must fly to Samoa. And then you go from Samoa to American Samoa. And I was ready to hop on the plane, this little, little plane that you do a little island hop on from Samoa to American Samoa. And as I was waiting to go on the plane, my name was called on the loudspeaker and I discovered that I was not going to be allowed to enter the country because they had some new visa that had just come in and there was some, yeah, I just wasn't going to be allowed to go because I didn't have this particular visa. And I was a bit worried about that. And so I, I quickly ran out of the airport because my family had just dropped me off there. I have relatives in Samoa. My dad is from there. And my family were all by the fence waving off the little plane that they thought I was on. <laughs> and I came out from the airport and I said, hey, I'm over here. And they looked at me and they said, what are you doing here? And I told them, well, I can't go because I don't have the visa. And, you know, my auntie is a very strong woman. And I praise God for her because she said, let me get onto this. And, you know, we were praying because there was just, if I didn't get to American Samoa that day, the next plane that left there would mean I'd miss half the week of the meetings because they don't fly all the time. So we prayed, but my auntie, she took out her phone, she dialed a number, and it just so happens that, that I have an uncle in American Samoa who's the chief of immigration there. <laughs> and I didn't know about him. And she told him, you better get onto this and you better find a way to get Charissa into this island because if she's not there today, she's not going to be able to get to this church meeting. And so I don't know what my uncle did, but the next thing I knew was my name was called again. I was put on the next plane out, the last plane for that day, and they put me in the the pilot seat the co-pilot seat so i got to fly next to the pilot from samoa to american samoa <laughs> and for someone who doesn't really like flying you know that was a very spiritual experience for me and i'm grateful to god that he got me there and i'll just tell you this the pilot as soon as i sat in that seat he looked at me and i said i've never sat here before and he said it's all right just do everything that I tell you. I said, sure, I'll do anything you tell me. And uh, he said, you see that button there on the dashboard? He said, when I tell you to press it, you press it. When, you t when I tell you to, to press it again, you press it again. I said, yep, sure. So with the plane takes off and he says, press the button, push it down. So I push the button down and the plane gets up and he says, bring it up. So I bring it up. And the whole way there, he's barking orders at me, up, down, up, down to the, to the, the button. And I was going to do everything he said because I wasn't going to let this plane crash. This is my first time flying a plane. And as we start coming into sight of American Samoa, he looks at me and he says, that's a very important job you've been doing. I said, really, what is it? He says, it's the air conditioning. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but God is good. He got me from Samoa to American Samoa. He was faithful. That's what I'm trying to tell you. When I needed God to come through, God made a way and he will do that for you. He does it for us all the time. When we are in situations where we cannot see a way forward, God is faithful and God is true. But that's not it. There's more. Look at verse 12 of Revelation chapter 19. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. This same Jesus we saw 
or at least we see, walking among the candlesticks in the first chapter of Revelation, we see him tenderly caring for his church bride in every age. Well, here we see him coming as one who sees all and knows all. But not only that, he rules all. And don't miss this. He is wearing so many crowns, John can't even count them. Amen. <laughs> now, there are two words for crown in the New Testament, in the Greek. One is Stephanos, which is a victor's crown. And the other is, uh, that is an overcomer's crown. And this is the crown that is promised to everyone who overcomes in the letters to the seven churches. But the other Greek word is a diadem, and it refers to a royal crown. And listen to this, friends. Jesus wears both. Jesus wears both the Stephanos and the diadem. He wears both the victor's crown and the royal crown because he overcame the evil one. And it is because Jesus overcame that we can overcome too as we put our lives in his hands. When the angel of the Lord met Samson's parents, Manoah, that's the father of Samson, he said, to the angel of the Lord in Judges 13, verses 17 and 18. He said this, What is your name? That when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, listen to this, Why do you ask my name? Seeing as it is wonderful. Now, in other words, the Hebrew of this means incomprehensible, in extraordinary, that is it's too wonderful for you to understand. My name is too wonderful for you to understand. There are aspects of the, of the character of Jesus that are too wonderful for us to understand. Friends, Jesus is better than the best thoughts you've ever had of him. He's more wonderful than my mind can conceive. He's more wonderful than my heart can believe. He goes above and beyond my highest thoughts and fondest dreams. He is everything that my soul ever longed for, everything he promised, and so much more. That's what Jesus is to us. Amen? <laughs> By the way, the Bible says that if we overcome he promises that he will give to us a new name too. Isn't that wonderful? So he is the one who is faithful and true. Number two, he has a name that is too wonderful for us to understand. There's another name in Revelation 19 that we find is given to Jesus. It's in verse 13 through 15. The Bible says here, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself shall treads the winepress of fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Well, I ran a little bit further than I anticipated, but that's okay. Listen, how many groups do you know show up to their wedding on their wedding day with an army of angels? Because <laughs> that's how Jesus comes. And in fact, in the book of Jude, Jude is only one chapter, Jude 1 verse 14, the Bible says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. And I'm just going to be very honest with you and tell you, I think there's something almost ruggedly handsome about the fact that Jesus comes with a robe dipped in blood. And you say, Sharissa, wait a minute. This is a strange thing for you to say right now. What are you talking about? Well, let me explain. When I was in primary school, I was bullied. And it was so bad, I would cry every day. I didn't want to go to school. I begged my mom to let me stay home. and She would hug me and wipe away my tears and pray with me and tell me it would be okay. But if my dad walked by the room and he saw me crying and he saw my mom trying to console me, he would ask me a very simple question. He just wanted to know their names and what they look like 
and where they lived <laughs> because my dad was going to do something about it. <laughs> and uh, when, I, when I see Jesus here in Revelation chapter 19, I think it's a beautiful picture. He's wearing a robe dipped in blood because he is pictured as a groom who has been fighting for us. And if at any point while she was waiting for her groom to come, if the bride wondered if her groom still loved her, well, according to ancient culture, she would go back and she could go down to the town and go to the local synagogue and she could pull out that ketubah covenant that they had both signed. And she could open that covenant and she could read the promises that her groom had made to her. Do we have something like that today as well? Yes, we do. Jesus has given to us the promises of his word. His word are filled, is filled with promises that he has made to us. And so whenever we start to wonder, does Jesus still love me? We can read his word and we can know he does. Has Jesus, does he still remember me? Has he forgotten about me? You can read his word. No, he will never forget you. Will he be faithful to me? Yes, you can see in his word, he's promised and his word is a living thing. It's an extension of himself. When, when God speaks, the world comes into being. When Jesus spoke, the waves are stilled. When he speaks, the fig tree withers and the dead come to life. And so by his word, the Bible tells us the heavens were made. And so I encourage us as we are here at PYC, we're having a, a real infilling of the word but let's keep this going even after PYC. Let's keep reading God's word so that his word can affect the transformation in our life. And as we read it, let's pray that God would do this and that he would help us and teach us to apply these things to our own lives. Well, the last name that I see here in this passage is actually there in verse 16. The Bible says, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, and it is this, King of kings and Lord of lords. I really don't think that John was able to sleep too well after this vision. I think he, his mind must have been spinning after everything he had seen. And uh, are you familiar there with Handel's Messiah? Have you ever heard of Handel's Messiah and the Hallelujah Chorus? I'm sure you have. It's a very famous piece of classical music. But that whole work, Handel's Messiah, this whole composition, it actually was composed in just 24 days, which if you're not familiar with what this composition is, you should go and look it up because it's a huge piece of work. There's lots of different uh, musical genius there. And 24 days, he wrote it all. But of that 24 days, one week he spent composing the Hallelujah Chorus, which is probably my favorite part. But as he was writing that chorus, as story goes, uh, his assistant was looking for Handel in the house and couldn't find him anywhere. Finally, he comes upon Handel in his study. And Handel had tears running down his cheeks. And he said, as he held up the score, he had just finished writing. And it was the Hallelujah Chorus. He said these words, I did think I saw heaven opened. And I did think I saw the face of God. One day. We are going to see heaven open. John got to see the heavens open and in vision he sees Jesus coming on a white horse. And I think if Jesus, rather, if John was a wedding photographer, he'd be a good one because he doesn't miss any details. <laughs> he tells us even that the detail on the thigh, we see his name here. This is, we see his robe here. He's not wearing someone else's robe. We know this robe belongs to Jesus. It's got his name on it. And I just think this is amazing. There are many kings, but Jesus is the king of all those kings. There are many lords, but Jesus is the Lord of all lords. And uh, our God, he's the son of God. He's, he's the sinner's savior. Jesus is honest. He's unique. There's no one like him. He's the miracle of the age. He's able to supply all of our needs. He's available for us when we need him. He sympathizes. He saves. He heals. He cleanses. He forgives. He defends. He is amazing. The heavens cannot contain him, let alone we find words to explain him. And this is what I find when I come to Revelation chapter 19. 
the thundering hoofbeats of Revelation's white horse rider tell us that we are loved more than we are ever, more than we can ever know by a king who is coming soon. And when we accepted the proposal of heaven's groom, our past, our present, and our future, it all takes on new meaning. So you and I can say today, right on, King Jesus, because no man shall hinder thee. I want you to know tonight that all heaven is extremely excited about this coming climax of, of this love story of God for his people, his church, because the marriage supper of the Lamb it's not far away right now. The wedding of the ages is almost here. This isn't fake news that I'm sharing with you tonight. There's no budget constraints to this wedding. There's no guest limit to this wedding. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle had a beautiful wedding. They spent in excess of 50 million Australian dollars on their wedding. I'm not sure what that is in your currency, but that. The one that heaven is preparing, it's going to be a billion times more spectacular than this. So here's my point. The groom is ready. The armies of heaven are ready. The place is ready. The meal is ready. The decorations are ready. The choir is ready. But what about the bride? There's no wedding without a bride. How... Do you prepare to meet a groom like this? I've been a bride just recently and it's a lot of work. My question is when I read Revelation 19, how do you prepare to meet a groom like this? Before I got married, I, I had a dream about my wedding and um, I dreamt that I'd forgotten to, to buy a wedding dress. <laughs> Everything was ready. It was the day before the wedding and I just was put the last decoration in place. And then in my dream, somebody asked me, so have you got your dress? And I woke up in a cold sweat because in my dream, I hadn't got the dress. What would it be <laughs> to have heaven's bridegroom come and not be ready to meet him? Notice with me Revelation chapter 19. We're nearly there. Revelation 19 and notice verses 7 and onwards, Revelation 19 and verse 7. Here yeah, the Bible says this. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Verse 8. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who, who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true sayings of God. There are only two women in Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation, and it's not hard to tell which one's the bride. She looks like a bride. She's dressed like a bride. She's radiant. She looks so beautiful and white. And when the Bible says that this garment that she wears, it's the righteous acts of the saints, it means that the bride will develop a character that is similar to her Lord's to make her ready to meet him. But can we manufacture a character like Jesus? No, the Bible tells us that our best attempts are embarrassing. So listen to this. It just keeps getting better. You see, the word here in the Greek for granted, it means given. The white robes aren't self-made, purchased online. They are supplied by Jesus, given to the redeemed. Jesus, he does it all. He paid the price. He prepared the place. And now we find he provides the garment too. He is the one who presents you and I faultless before his glory with exceeding joy. He is the one who washes us whiter than snow. And how does he do it? Last detail, and then we will wrap this one up for tonight. But it was customary 
in first century Judaism for a Jewish groom to express his sincerity of his pledge to his newly betrothed bride by giving to her a precious gift. And this was the bride's assurance that he would return for her. Does Jesus give to us any gift? Did he give to his people a gift before he left and promise us a gift that he would give to us when he left? He does. His gift to his church, his betrothal gift, is the gift of the Holy Spirit. God, in his grace and mercy, has sent to us the Holy Spirit to empower us and to teach us how we can be like Jesus. He changes us. He transforms us through the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And this is God's assurance of our future with him. Isn't that amazing? Have you surrendered your heart to Jesus? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to do his work of transformation in your life? Because if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, if each day when you wake up, you first look up and you say, Lord Jesus, please, I give my life to you. Please come into my heart. Come into my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Then God will work in you for to do and to will of his good pleasure. And he is the one who prepares us to meet our coming bridegroom. And all God's people on the Zoom call said, Amen. <laughs> I find this really amazing. The more you study, the more you learn about Jesus, the better he gets. Uh, when we commit our lives to Jesus, we become part of his beloved church bride. The King of Kings is not just a king. He's an engaged king. And soon he's going to be a married king. We're all getting married to Jesus when he comes. You see, with earnest longing, Jesus desires to bring us to his, to his home. He, is, he wants for us to be completely happy and safe and to live with him forever. We're engaged to him. But are we fully engaged to Jesus? Listen to this uh, last story and then I will close out tonight. Joni Erickson Tata, have you ever heard of her? Some of you have, some of you haven't. When I was a teenager, I read her testimony in a book. And uh, she was paralyzed after diving into shallow water as a teenager. But she said some beautiful things about her wedding day. And I'm going to read to you here. I've got it on my screen. I'll read to you what she wrote about her wedding day. She got married and she was in a wheelchair. She said, I felt awkward as my girlfriends strained to shift my paralyzed body into a cumbersome wedding gown. No amount of corseting and binding my body to give me a perfect shape would do. The dress just didn't fit well. And then as I was wheeled into the church, I glanced down and noticed that I'd accidentally run over the hem of my dress, leaving a greasy tire mark. My paralyzed hands couldn't hold the bouquet of daisies that lay off center on my lap. And my chair, though decorated for the wedding, was still a big, clunky, gray machine with belts, gears, and ball bearings. I certainly didn't feel the picture-perfect bride in a bridal magazine. I inched my chair closer to the last pew to catch a glimpse of Ken in the front. There he was, standing tall and stately in his formal attire. I saw him looking for me, craning his neck to look up the aisle. My face flushed, and I suddenly couldn't wait to be with him. I had seen my beloved. The love in Ken's face had washed away all my feelings of unworthiness. I was his perfect bride. How easy it is for us to think that we are so utterly unlovely, especially to someone as lovely as Christ. But he loves us with the bright eyes of a bridegroom's love and cannot wait for the day when we are united with him forever. I thought that was beautiful, that reflection. Friends, one day soon, we will see our warrior groom who is faithful and true. He has a name that is more wonderful than our minds can conceive. He's the word of God, and he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. We will see him 
face to face. Imagine it, the coming conqueror of conquerors, coming with all the angels of heaven to redeem his chosen people. Truly, the high point of human history will be the, the appearance of Jesus coming to save us from this world of sin. And so tonight, as we close out, I just have a few simple questions that I'd like to ask you and leave with you. Number one, does Jesus have your heart? Because he loves you. That's the story of the Bible. This is why today and every day, God calls for us to surrender our lives to him in the morning. Come to him each day because he loves us more than we can ever know. And so as we close out, when things don't go our way, God wants us to trust him, that he will lead us through the disappointments. When death looks like it gains the upper hand, then God says, trust me because he will still bring life. He promises he can bring life. When people disappoint and fail us, God's call is for us to trust him because he will never fail us. And when we don't see God at work, we should just pray and trust that God is at work and he will take care of us. Jesus' final words in the book of Revelation are these, surely I come quickly. And John's response at the end of the book is simply this, amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. Tonight, do you want to say with John those same words, I give my life to Jesus and Lord Jesus, come quickly. That is my prayer and I pray that it is your prayer too. Let us close with prayer tonight. Our loving Father in heaven, thank you for this amazing chapter that we were able to step through together tonight. Thank you for Jesus, for his amazing love for us. Lord, as a church and as individuals, we have been unfaithful to you so many times, but all the time your faithfulness continues to us still. And truly, Lord, we love you because we see you have first loved us. Our hearts are conquered by your love. And today we choose right now to give our lives to Jesus. We pray that the Holy Spirit might come into our hearts and may you change us, Lord. May you make us more like Jesus so that when he comes, we will be ready to meet him. We'll be transformed from glory to glory by the Spirit of God. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.